It should have a button that would be like the J-Cal button, which would be like troll this person. <laughs> and it would be the like, troll <laughs> options. And like my troll option would be like, why do you, why does Hamas, why does everybody hate Hamas? And then link to the clip of Sasha Baron yeah. Cohen. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. talking about hummus and Hamas. And he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's like uh, trolling them. Trolling option should be there to do like yeah. jokes and stuff like that. I, that yeah. would be a great startup is uh, an agent that follows you around the internet and then optimizes your trolling and comedy and just makes a, you know, a mockery of everything. Mockery AI. Somebody go grab that domain name. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Miro helps take ideas from in your head to out there in the world with its ability to democratize collaboration and input. Sign up for free at Miro.com slash startups. Lemon.io. Need to speed up your product development without draining your budget? Hire vetted engineers from Europe at Lemon.io. Go to Lemon.io slash twist to get 15% off for the first four weeks. And iConnections is a platform to connect and meet with elite capital allocators through their online platform and bespoke events. The first 25 VC funds to sign up for iConnections Miami 2024 event in January of next year will receive a 20% discount. Head to iConnections.io slash twist to sign up today. All right, everybody, welcome back to This Week in Startups. It's, once again, it's our AI roundtable. Call it This Week in AI if you want. Uh, every week, we're going to do this until this AI thing slows down, which basically means until the singularity AGI happens and humans are retired. With us again, Sandeep Madra, we call him Sunny. He's the co-founder of Definitive Intelligence that lets users view on and off-chain data. But let's be honest, he's pivoting this whole, th pivoting this whole crypto on-chain analysis data thing to AI, right? You're, you're all in. You're full board AI. We are all in on AI, yes. Yeah. So yep. uh, enough with the uh, chains and the tokens and the NFTs. It's enough. They're uh, important. And also important. <laughs> What'd you say? They're important. They're going to be what's going to, oh, the source of truth is going to be powered by that. So yes. Gonna... So it'll be a feature like of the li wider new internet. Uh, but this is really AI is the new web. 3.0. I think that's going to be how we'll look back on it. Vinny Lingham is here. Vinny credit for that. Yeah. Yeah, he did. I'm giving Vinny credit. Here he goes. Vinny Lingham, founder of Weight Room, one-on-one -on -one video conferencing for your corporation, your enterprise, including a bunch of AI stuff. How you doing, Vinny? Hey, Jake Young. Good to be on. All right. Let's get started. I'm in New York it's City. Sunny. I just got, I got my coffee. I, I'm, I had a little sticker shock. $8 for a cold brew. New York's wild and out here. I, I walked over. I'm at the SALT conference. Just got back from UAE. And uh, I'm speaking at the SALT conference. So my you, whirlwind tour continues. Did you get an Hissa bagel? You know, I went to Sullivan Street Bakery. I'm over here ah. on 48th and 9th by, on the uh, Hell's Kitchen. We're the Irish, you know, my, my <laughs> Irish brothers and sisters. We, we ran this part of town for a little while. Uh, but I just went to Sullivan Street Bakery and like a big argument broke out there. The tension is very high in New York right now. Yeah. So oh, I really? had to step in. Okay. It's a little, everybody's on a little bit of edge. Usually New the Yorkers are a little chippy. But it does, you know, it usually dissipates pretty quick, but there was a, on the line, there was a little bit of a brouhaha. Woman asked for a piece of bread. The woman who was taking orders her first day, she didn't speak English perfectly. They got into it a little bit. And then the manager said, listen, I got to protect her. Woman came back and said, I don't really appreciate the way you talked to me. Said, well, you know, I got to protect her. She was like, protect me from what? Protect her from what? It's like a white woman, black woman. Yeah manager comes out and then i was like well i gotta get in the middle of this and i was like listen you got to apologize in a more sincere way and i can understand why you would take that the wrong way that didn't come out well but listen let's all get a coffee maybe we can get a couple of pastry going on here a complimentary whatever and i had to dial the whole thing i, I brought the whole tension down i had to explain to this woman who's the manager of solid street bakery that when the words come out wrong i don't think she was being racist exactly but it kind of came out a little bit racist so i had to step in and be like hey listen you know you and she, her apology was very weak very weak apology okay insincere so there's your story everybody a little story time and then i come around the corner and there's a girl in a bikini and another girl dancing in the middle of ninth avenue and i'm like this place has gone crazy since i left and then i look down they've got their camera mounted on the L lamppost they're doing a tiktok they're doing a tiktok dance in the middle of ninth avenue so 
That's it. Those are my two stories in one block of getting my coffee. Uh, yeah, it's New York in springtime. It's just people are losing their mind. The snow has started to melt and it's, you know, it's like in Tahoe, the snow melts and we get on our mountain bikes in New York. People just go crazy. Um, but you, you guys been to the UAE? Have you, have you been to the region at uh, all? I, I've been to Abu Dhabi and uh, I've been Dubai. to Dubai, yeah. That's where I went. Yeah. yeah. Pretty wild, huh? Yeah, you know, it's um, it's it's very hot. <laughs> Even this time of year, it's pretty hot. It's like, you know. It's 100 um, degrees, yeah. It's like going to Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah speaking, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I prefer Vegas. <laughs> well, I mean, but if you lived in that region, it is kind of like the, it's like yeah, a combination yeah. of Vegas, New York, and Washington, D.C., or New York. Abu Dhabi is very impressive. Give us a, uh, give us a uh, 90 yeah. second summary. The startup vibe, the investor vibe, the LP vibe. Give it Four Seasons was like Rose, uh, you know, like the Rosewood. You know, I came downstairs and 90 seconds, four people from Silicon Valley stopped me to say hi. You know, like who were in the region doing meetings or had moved their companies there. And tons of startups. I came out of a dinner. And there was like a table of 10 startups. And so startups are going there for funding. Startups are opening offices there. And during COVID, they remained open. So it was kind of like, what was it Sweden that remained open in Europe? Or I think it was Sweden that stayed open. Yeah, Sweden. Yep, they did. Yeah. And so Dubai and Abu Dhabi became like Sweden. They, they had rules, but they were like, we're going to stay open. Um, and everybody goes to their office. And it's incredibly international. There's only 500,000 nationals, but there's 10 million people. And they built everything in the last 20 years. So it reminded me, you guys ever go to like Shanghai or China or Shenzhen yep. in the yep. like, but in like the 2005, 2010 period when they were building, there were sunny cranes everywhere. And they have like a Cleveland clinic, NYU, the Louvre. I mean, and not like little tiny outposts, like rivaling, uh, uh, the rival, but like um, rivaling the actual ones, like giant outposts so they are they're they're for real and they have a 20 year window as explained to me multiple times we've got 20 30 years to convert oil wealth you know the geographic lottery that they hit into something else and something else is going to be finance and tech and they don't want to just be lps they see themselves as becoming vcs so well, they're looking ooh. to build bridges with the venture yeah. community not just to LP them. They, that's great. They want to be LPs and funds, but they also want to be uh, doing directs. And so they, they Mubadala, uh, I met with and a bunch of other firms, but it wasn't a fundraiser trip. I just went with Brad Gerser, our friend of the pod, to just uh, hang out and learn about the region. And then I wound up getting 10 meetings, you know, 48 hours before I landed, people wanted to meet with me. So I did a bunch of meetings and, you know, it's, uh, it's a very progressive place. It's kind of like New York in the 90s, I would say equivalent you know socially mm -hmm. and how are the builders so interestingly people from europe from asia singapore india which is a hop skip uh, to uae yep, they're putting hours. their companies in dubai uh because of tax because of 10-year golden visas so like mm -hmm. if you want to get a visa you know how it's hard it is around the world to get it across borders they're just like yeah come here and then they get all kinds of tax breaks for your company. So if you were going to put your company somewhere, if you go to Abu Dhabi, they're going to support the heck out of you. And they have like their own WeWork and they have this place, Hub 71. So there were a lot of startups there. And these were legit startups that had gone to YC, you know, international startups. But instead of basing themselves in India, Singapore, China, Australia, London, they're just in Dubai. And yeah. they can get anywhere and anybody can get there, right? And they get good, um, you know how Canada gives... Um, uh, what do they call it when they give you subsidies for your developers when you're doing the R &D? tax credits, R and D tax credits, credits yeah. R and D credits. Yeah. So I think they're 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 getting in on that a little bit. And so, good place if you are not in the United States to to land your company. I think, um, and the tax treatment's sick. Like you don't pay any tax, basically. Any taxes? Yeah. Public Dobby is investing heavily in in crypto and blockchain. They've actually um, they f they funded this blockchain called Venom. Uh, I think they hmm. put a, a billion dollars into the foundation. Like oh. that's just a, you know, years of billion bucks going see the ecosystem and going it's crazy it's like there's so much money that's going into blockchain and it's exactly what you're saying jay jay yeah. they're trying they're trying to buy uh, the tech future and get you know knowing that oil is limited i mean california we're going to be off oil in 10 12 years yeah we're you know, the tip of the gas. spear yeah yeah right. so like and not just us sweden 
I think Scandinavia, a couple other countries, like, you know, get no more gas vehicles in about a decade from now. And so the writing's on the wall long term for, I think, for, for, for oil, uh, if we move to electric. And if that, you know, that, that's a 30 year story, 40 year story in California. And then mm -hmm. there are countries that haven't even started yet. So I yeah. think that's how they look at it. Um, and so it's pretty impressive that they have this kind of 30 year vision to, to sort of convert it. Uh, and some of these sovereign wealth funds, you know, they have a couple of hundred billion dollars. And so for a fund manager like myself, if I wind up going to Harvard or well, let me let me take that again, Nick. I don't want to mention Harvard. For a fund manager like myself, who is a new fund manager, you know, I've only had funds for whatever, eight, nine years um, before that was angel investing. A lot of the endowments here in the United States are full up. They've mm -hmm. built relationships with the top firms. Mm -hmm. The top firms come back with new product, new funds. They don't add new names. And so even with my track record and, you know, my notoriety or brand, it is hard for me to break into one of those endowments that are now over, these endowments are over committed to venture. So if you had 5% in venture and you were some endowment, and then all the public market equities came down, the denominator, the size of your uh, endowment went down. So that, and if it went down a third, you know, now all of a sudden your venture position went up because the venture position doesn't get marked mm. to market. Yep. But the public equities do. So now they're, you know, 10% or 8% venture and they're like, oh, we got to get down to five again. That's our mandate. How do you do that? You've got to either wait for the marks to come down on the venture portfolios where the fund managers are lowering their marks, or you're going to have to invest more money in public markets. I mean, you just basically, a lot of them are taking a pause on venture. So I think that's, a very unique moment in time. It's like a poker game where, oh, this week four seats are open. Those four seats, like it could go to, you know, the Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund, UAE's, Saudi, whoever. They're going to have a unique moment in time while the yeah. while the large endowments here are taking a pause. Well, you have a unique chance too with the story, you know, around building around what AI represents and how yeah. that's more aligned to what you've been doing for a long time, right? And so. Early stage is very attractive. Right now, yeah. people are like, the, the late stage is kind of messy because the cap tables are so screwed up and they're overpriced in many cases still. So that whole late stage game is too many players, too high prices, not enough traction. And so early stage, you're starting fresh. And yep. look at all the activity we're seeing. Founders always ask me and my team to punch up their pitch decks, right? You got to have a great pitch deck if you're a startup. That's obvious. It's table stakes. Great news for you. My team just worked with a team at Miro, that awesome whiteboarding software I've been telling you about, and we created an amazing pitch deck template for founders. And you can see it if you're watching video right now, or just head to Miro.com slash Miroverse and search for pitch deck, M-I-R-O.com slash M-I-R-O-V-E-R-S-E, and then just search for pitch deck. You'll see it there. This is basically going to help you take your pitch from zero to hero, be VC ready, Go check it out right now. If you're a hybrid or you're a fully remote team, Miro is incredibly useful for you. It's like an old school in-person whiteboarding session, but it's distributed, it's asynchronous, and it lets you brainstorm ideas, collaborate on projects, and more from anywhere in the world. So when you think of Miro, think zero to one, but even faster. And it's so much more than just that simple digital whiteboard. Your team can collaborate on all kinds of important projects, planning, research, design, feedback cycles for your product and remember faster inputs faster outcomes and velocity is how startups win we all know that to access our new miroverse template and thousands of others sign up today for free and uh, get your miro account going miro.com slash startups that's miro.com slash startups to sign up for free what are you seeing sunny you you're you're you like to tinker yeah so Give us a, you know, this is the best part of the show. The, yeah. Everybody's yeah. talking about this, you Ooh. know, uh, regular series we're doing every Monday here on This Week in Startups yep. is our AI day. We start the week with AI because this is a trend. This is a trend that's moving at a daily pace. And so we're yeah. covering it weekly, which means every week there's going to be three or four important things that we'll just demo for you every Monday yeah. morning. Get your coffee, get your cold brew, whatever you're doing, uh, and we'll just get into it. So let's get into it, Sonny. Yeah. Well, you know, here's a good one that, you know, talks about pace of innovation and startups versus kind of established companies. So I think you had Aaron Levy on uh, a couple of weeks ago now, right? To talk about- Last his, week. <laughs> yeah, last week. Yeah. So, okay. The, you know, 
about sort of the new features that they're launching with Box AI, right? Where you can take documents and um, you can upload them into Box and you can have it turn them into Q&A. Well, um, you know, just to highlight someone who's doing something quite similar, I'm going to pull up here this uh, service called Chat PDF. And what this allows you to do, and it's openly available, you don't even have to log in. You can, for the folks that are listening, I'm just logged into chatpdf.com and I'm uploading PDFs. I uploaded kind of three different ones. I uploaded the uh, Berkshire 2022 letter by Warren Buffett. I also uploaded the actual law of the Inflation Reduction Act and then a Take summary of the plus, Inflation Reduction Act. plus on that just to make yeah, it a little sure. better. Of course. Yeah, Here we go. Perfect. Yeah. 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 yeah, one more. And one more. All right. Okay. Boom. Now I it fills the screen. It's good for everybody. All right. Yeah. All right. JCal mode. And <laughs> I don't want to have to put uh, my grandpa glasses on. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's amazing. And, and look, like this is happening in a lot of different places, but um, what's amazing is like this service has been stood up. It's available. You can use it. Obviously it's using LLMs and it really highlights like how fast things are moving because with box that's still in, in like a private beta. And right. so I think th this is kind of, I'm trying to tie it back into what we were talking about a few minutes ago, but like the, the pace at which this stuff is happening is incredible because you have to wait, you have to sign up and obviously Box will give you all the enterprise features and lots of people will use it. But this is something that everyone really needs to think about because you can come here, take your PDFs, I think is really useful. Uh, I've been using it for the last couple of days to just so summarize. So you uploaded Berkshire's 2022 letter. This yep. is Warren Buffett's letter and it said, welcome to the exciting world of Berkshire Hathaway's performance. This PDF uh, provides an overview of Berkshire's annual percentage change in per share market value compared to the S&P 500 with dividends included from 1965 to 2019. Here are three examples. Here are three example questions you may have about this file. So what is this called when it anticipates your questions? Has the industry come up with a prompt for this where you anticipate what the person's question suggested future queries it's it's something new right it it is um you know and, and this is like a really big area where you know things are going from the uh going towards i would say where it's it's starting to anticipate what a user would like to learn about what has been given and it's doing that based on sort of all the learning that's going on in these systems and you know sort of the prompts that are coming in and i think this is a really powerful aspect of uh, the lead in towards ultimately AGI is that when it, it, it can, you know, predict what we're doing, Vinny, maybe, you know, you can jump in here because you guys are obviously adding these features into weight room. Like, how do you think about this? Um, you know, it, 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 so here's how we, we're thinking about it right now. Um, it's really good for, I mean, you take a PDF, there's some context to the PDF, but it doesn't really understand the bigger picture of what's going on. It's, uh, it's based upon the content in it. So, for a, a large scale uh, PDF, three, four, five hundred pa pages, it can, it can probably do a pretty good job. The small PDFs, there's just probably a lot of context missing. So well, the way we think about it is when we're working with companies and they're using Waitroom and they're, um, we're extracting the data from a single conversation, it needs broader context for the whole company. It doesn't, it, you know, it, it won't understand what is going on. Give an on example from of that. Yeah. Okay. Give me so, an example so, of that. So here's an example. Let's say we have we have a a, a company that, that manufactures a certain uh, you know um, you know some device okay some box and they have a shipping delay because there's a component that's missing uh, that they haven't received for the manufacturing process and now they've got a logistical problem now imagine there's a meeting about this and people are having this conversation and you know the AI could can transcribe the the, the conversation it can kind of infer what's going on based upon you know what it knows so far. But it doesn't know what the far-reaching effects of that could be. So, for example, let's say it's a really large order. Now, all of a sudden, that means that you can't bill the customer, which means that the financial projections are now out by 30 days, let's say. And that means that the company is not going to have enough cash to pay payroll at the end of the month, and now it needs a line of credit. Now, th th these are the things that takes days to surface up in a company, uh, and, and the AI can do it immediately, can flag it, saying this order is critical, we're behind now. We have a cash flow problem. Alert finance. Let them go to the the bank and you know get some sort of facility or speak to the CEO or whatever it is. Um, but the, without the context of how this functions in the big organization, it's just one conversation that could seem very Got arbitrary. It. Yeah, that's a great example. So we're here on the phone talking about our new product. It's shipping from Shenzhen. It's delayed, 
And then when a product is delayed, the, the LLM might be able to say, okay, when products are delayed, what are the downstream effects of that? Exactly. Customers are unhappy, uh, returns or refunds may happen, extra expense, we're going to burn another month of runway. But if it doesn't know your uh, payroll system or your orders, it can't really anticipate that. Yeah. So, so we're going from a world where, you know, the, the, like let's not confuse what AI is supposed to be or what it is with what, like what transcription is, for example, or just basic interpretation. Basic transcription interpretation is we've had that for years. You know, we've had uh, it's table stakes now. It's table yep. stakes. Yeah, yeah. You have to just be able to understand what, what the, what the audio means, you know? Um, yeah. Now it's about how do you take that and provide context? And so, I, I think the future, and I'll make a prediction. I think I, made, I put up a tweet about this actually. Um, but I, I think the future is is really about um, every company one day is going to have its own LLM, like of some sort. Yeah. So every major company within, I think within five years, uh, I found my tweet, but um, will have its own its own LLM on some level. Uh, just because, like, how many conversations are happening in a company every single day within? Yeah, they're happening in Slack. They're happening in email. They're happening over iMessage signal. There's, they're happening in Notion yeah, or it's, Coda it's, it's, documents. Slack's a good example. So now, yeah. so now, imagine the AI, the LLM for the company, has access to every conversation in Slack. Obviously, private ones will be excluded, or whatever. But every every sort of group conversation is now being fed into the LLM live. Every video conversation. Uh, yes, or, or all your audio Zooms ones, or transcripts. It's all going in. And yeah. so, you know, basically, I think within five years, the if you're not running an LLM, a custom LLM for your company that's been trained five on your years, business. Five months. Well, I think things, no, 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 but uh, like, no, I, I say, I, I say five years before, like every company will have to do it. I, the, including the laggers. Yeah. Because yeah, la it does because seem it'll, to me. It'll put them out of business. If they don't do it, it'll put them out of business. And, yeah. and like I, I was at this conference, Locology, and, and, and my quote that they quoted me on this tweet was, you will have virtual agents sitting in every virtual meeting that happens within a company. So like, well, the, you, know. you know, Sonny, this was something we went through. We've been on this concept of doing transcripts for this week in startups since, you know, maybe the third, fourth, fifth year of the show, because people want to get the knowledge out of it or get summaries. And I have done multiple tries at this, but human beings like to do a transcript is a couple of hundred bucks. If you want to do it properly with some level of fidelity, you, you know, people's names, et cetera. Now you can't not get a transcript and the transcript is being done in multiple places. Uh -huh. YouTube was the first with the really rudimentary closed caption one. But Spotify, people are creating search engines now of Twist and All In, uh, new podcast players. It's built into Zoom, Descript, which people are using well, to edit. It's built in there. So I'll now we it. have five transcripts of every episode for free or close to free. I'll take, I'll take it a step further, JKL. Knowing how much content you've got on Twist for the mm -hmm. past decade plus, whatever it's been running, um, you could actually build some sort of an LLM or model, or you can just plug it into an existing model like OpenAI, and you could actually create a business coach. Yeah. Actually understand. So from every conversation you had with Brian Chesky and whoever else, yeah. all that knowledge, you could capture it all, you could you could transcribe it and incorporate it in the model, and now people could basically go and chat to uh, this, you know, what, 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 chat, tw twist chat, whatever you want to call it, and say, yeah. hey, I'm struggling with like my business. What is the, um, you know, how do I, how do I like make the numbers work? How do I, you know, get more runway? And it could give you a reference or it could just give you an answer. Yeah. Um, now I guess the, then the question becomes Sunny, who, who gets to use the data from the show? Because people are showing me experiments of like all in and this week in startups and doing that. And I'm like, that's fine for an experiment for a year. I just tell them all the yeah. same thing. Feel free to well, experiment for a year, but I'm starting to think like, I uploaded this to YouTube. They have the rights to the transcript. So I guess they're going to try to claim if I put this on YouTube or I put it on Spotify or if Spotify grabs the RSS feed that they now have the rights to the conversations that occurred here. I'm going to yep. need to like have a conversation with each of these platforms. I don't want my stuff in their LLMs necessarily unless I'm yep. getting some quid pro quo. Imagine this. You've got the greatest idea ever for a tech startup and it's going to change the world. But you got a problem. You don't have the engineers you need to make this a reality. Why? <laughs> it's hard to find engineers, right? Everybody's in competition for those great engineers. And you've got to manage your burn rate. You don't have unlimited resources like those big slow incumbents. You've got to be efficient. So 
Now imagine you had a partner who could provide you with more than 1,000 on-demand engineers, and these devs were vetted, experienced, result-oriented, and passionate about helping you grow. And they charged competitive rates. Sound too good to be true? Well, you need to head to Lemon.io right now. It is not too good to be true. Startups choose Lemon.io because they only offer hand-picked developers with three or more years of experience and really strong portfolios. Only 1% of candidates who apply get into Lemon.io. A couple of great launch founders have worked with Lemon.io and they had great experiences. So here is your call to action. To learn more, go to Lemon.io slash twist and find your perfect developer or tech team in 48 hours or less. And Twist listeners get 15% off the first four weeks. Stop burning money. Hire developers smarter, faster. Visit lemon.io slash twist. Let's unpack a couple of things. So, you know, one, regarding the transcripts and translation, um, you know, we'll kind of maybe lead into Google I.O. in a second, but they, they announced something called Universal Translator. All right, here's the 44 second clip. Let's uh, listen and then we'll see you on the other side of 44 seconds. Universal Translate is an experimental AI video dubbing service that helps experts translate a speaker's voice while also matching their lip movements. Let me show you how it works. What many college students don't realize is that knowing when to ask for help and then following through on using helpful resources is actually a hallmark of becoming a productive adult. Muchos universitarios no comprenden que saber cuándo pedir ayuda y usar recursos útiles es en realidad una clave para convertirse en un adulto productivo. We use next generation translation models to translate what the speaker is saying, models to replicate the style and the tone, and then match the speaker's lip movements, then we bring it all together. And that's wild. So that yeah. solves like the so, uh, Saturday afternoon kung fu movie problem. Where yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a film from China and yeah. putting American I, I, dubbing and you can see the lips are not matching at all. <laughs> I, I love this because I hate, like, even on Netflix, there's so many good shows people have told me about uh, and either I would yeah. watch it was, uh, like, I would rather watch subtitles than watch yes. the, the English dubbing. And if they can change that, I'm all in. Like, that's great. And that creates, it opens up a universe of content. Pretty amazing. We got pitched yeah. on this week in startups being uh, re-acted reenacted i guess where they were going to hire voiceover actors to do my part or you know and aaron's part or you know your part sonny and your part Vinny, and then you know basically republish the podcast in german and it was going to be i think i don't know if nick remembers but i think it was 500 an episode and they were like yeah you know for whatever that is one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year you could have an entire german version then you get just one german sponsor to do all 250 episodes for thousand dollars an episode and you'll be a profit and i was like ah it's a lot of work yeah. And then you'd have to have voice actors full time you, you, for the scale of the show. You'd have full time voice actors, and this just eliminates all of that work. It's wild. Yeah. And so coming back to what, what you said here, so first of all, the platforms that you're publishing to are going to start making these features available. They started to your point with transcripts; they'll mm -hmm. just make this available. So I think that's something mindful. That's something you have to be mindful about. And then two, in terms of like how are people leveraging all that? That mm -hmm. I think. That's the Grimes problem. So first, you know, you're, this functionality is coming. So if you're kind of building in and around it, be very careful because the platforms are moving very quickly and adding, you know, this type of functionality. There's a lot of other great things that were launched at IO, which probably hit on what, you know, 20 or 30 different startups are working on right now. Yep. Um, and so, you know, you have to really think about what, what is your moat in that particular situation or what advantage do you have? Do not have to have a moat, but like something proprietary, maybe someone can show up and, cut a deal with you, Jake Cal, right? Yeah. And say, hey, we'll, we'll do this. And then, you know, we'll be responsible for, you know, sharing the rev share that comes from it. So I think that those are the type of things that people really yep. need to think about now. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the um, Google calls these, um, you know, questions, suggested questions, proactive prompts. Proactive and so this prompts. could be a very interesting um, experience, I think, for a lot of people to when they open an app or they open up some you know, their Slack for the day or their box and they're working. Work will be, the AI is going to be telling you what to do next at your company. It's going to be like, you know what? You have enough customers, but you're losing customers. So you really should be working on churn today. Here are three customers that aren't using your product anymore. Do you, would you like to schedule calls with them? You know, and like, it'll just, the AI will just know that these customers are going to churn 
and do something preemptive with them it is really could be uh transformative for people at work who have this sort of in 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 writing blank sheet of paper problem you know where yep. you're like it's very intimidating to have a blank sheet of paper for startups or any company you come to work sometimes you're like what do i do now what's the most important use of my time what's the most effective thing for me to do today and, and this could really help drive that you know everybody's been hearing about hugging face sunny maybe you could yep. explain what hugging face is um and why uh everybody in ai is talking about it right now yeah so think of hugging face as more of a collection of models and it has a wide range of models so you know we actually you know Vinny talked about this a few minutes ago where um we think there's a long-term belief that there'll be a lot of different ai models for a lot of different use cases and hugging face really was a leader in that and it continues to be where they don't have a single model they have lots of different models that have been uploaded by different users and so it's a combination of what you think of as say like a github and a a repository from uh, like for ai where there's lots of different models that not no that don't necessarily have to be for generative ai they've been there for you know traditional machine learning for for years and actually amazon partnered with them so that's who aws's partner has been up front in terms of giving users the selection they need for their you know particular use cases and i think it's really Why fascinating don't you pull it up and yeah. then walk us around the site give us a little tour of hugging face yeah, if you will in on. real time and yeah. uh you know make sure you sports cast it uh, as you do so yeah. well now on hold the show on. just yeah. telling us what we're seeing um yeah because they have the data sets there they've got models yeah uh etc yeah let me just pull this up here so and people know github is a community it's really like a community of developers so when somebody figures something out they post it and they show their work yeah and then if you show your work you get kind of social credit for that people follow you and if people follow you it kind of builds your career correct that's like part of the dynamic here is that people who are developers are looking for recognition they want to move up leaderboards and or get exposure at a site like github or here correct yeah it's a, it's a great great explanation and so you know here we've kind of gone uh, i've just clicked into the models area i'm on the website and what you can see here is different models and on the left you can organize them you know being multimodal computer vision natural language processing audio, audio tabular and you can see there's lots of different models there. There's like 6,000 pages to account, right? Right. So if you went to audio, there's yep. a collection of them, like audio yep. classification, voice uh, activity, uh, text-to-speech. So if you were to click text-to-speech uh, as but one example, it would give you a bunch of the models, but it's sorting the models by most downloaded. So if you didn't know where to set, where to start, Can Bayashi, I guess, is uh, been used 28,000 times in the last month. This yep. is the most downloaded text-to-speech model, and you can take this for free and start using it. Correct. And so this is, you know, like a collection of, and you can see here, like just the sheer number, right? There's like thousands and thousands of models here. And this goes back to, is, again, these are not all, you know, focused on generative AI. This is like sort of the broader reach of, um, you know, AI and machine learning. And so... This is what, you know, one of the things I get confused with when we see about regulation, because Hugging Face has been around a very long time, and these are all uh, AI machine learning models. I mean, where are you going to cut this off? There's so many here that are serving different purposes. And what's interesting is, if you were to click on, like, the first one, um, when you look at that one, uh, it actually has a hosted version of it on the, on the right. Underneath downloads in the last month, there's a hosted version. So if you typed in, welcome to This Week in Startups, and you hit compute, you could actually kind of see a basic version of it without a lot of operators or interference um yeah and so uh, we can put that in a post but yeah so this basically is why things are moving so fast because people are sharing their work yeah and this is the, the argument you know there was a, um, a sort of a leak of a go internal google document uh last week and so, you know tough to keep up with all this now too and in that Google document, what the, re, you know, sort of the summary of it was, uh, the highest level summary was open source is moving so fast that open source is going to win here. And it talked about just sort of the pace of innovation has come down to, to weeks. Um, you know, Paul Graham had a really good tweet this morning. Days. That we can, oh, <laughs> days. Right? Yeah, days. Yeah. Yeah. Days. And so, and yeah. that, you know, Paul Graham had a really good tweet this morning. I can try to find it and pull it up while we talk about I it. I saw just, it actually was trending. Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, I, I think it's it's really incredible. He basically uh, said what we've been saying on the show, which is, hey, this is moving um, much faster than anybody anticipated. Something major is happening when the time scale is days. I was there for the last one of these, the web. And even then, the time scale was closer to weeks than days. And he's absolutely right. Back then, every week or two, something would be added to the HTML spec. So people would be <laughs> like, hey, you know, I want to put a background on this. It's a gray background. Can I put a background color? Can I change the background? Like, yeah, okay, background colors is up and running a week later. Then somebody would say, hey, you know what? Background colors are nice. I would like to put an image in the background with a texture. Can I, you know, point to a JPEG? Like, okay, sure, put a JPEG in the background. Yeah, and and that's what we're seeing right now in terms of, you know, that that pace. And I he really nailed it. And I think Vinny first called it out in terms of like anxiety for for developers. I think that that anxiety is probably even continuing to move up the stack all the way into companies and projects and, and venture capitalists who venture capitalists. You know, I, I've had two startups now that we back to do something in AI. I wouldn't say which ones, and they came back to me like this is kind of built in. Everybody can do this now. All the work we did for the last three months is now built in native. Everybody has this superpower. So it's like, it's like building like some weapon and you're like, oh, I put a scope on this rifle. I can now, you know, have 50% more accuracy. And it's like, oh yeah, scopes are open source. Everybody's got a scope. It's like, okay, what's the next weapon? And you're like arms dealers in startups if, when you're building tools. And this arms race is like a free arms race. Everybody gets the latest weapon. Everybody gets the latest armor. Everybody gets the latest counter defense. And so a lot of founders have been telling me, well, what should I do? And I'm like, just keep racing and building and build an experience and a brand that speaks to people. If you have a nice brand and a community, people will stick around. I, I, I really think that's great advice. I think the community aspect of what's going to happen here is, is, and it's a good kind of tie into what Paul talked about. It's important because it's so early. The communities that establish around your projects are as yeah. critical now as more than ever before. And I also think we're going to go in a, a new world where, you know, we've seen the internet in the last 15 years become about sort of giants, titans, um, you know, <clears throat> you know, whether it's like, you know, the Facebooks of the world where everyone had to be there for kind of the network effect. Well, I think we'll now see a world where, you know, this, you, you can have smaller communities, could be 10,000, could be 50,000, could be 100,000. That's not internet scale, but I think it's, it's valid to build businesses around as well. So I think we'll see a uh, kind of a move towards that. Listen, when you're a fund manager like me, you're trying to raise money, the hardest thing to do is get in front of those elite LPs, limited partners, right? How do you get those connections? Well, iConnections is how you get them. So check out iConnections. This is a platform to help connect and meet elite capital allocators. What a great idea. And these are the biggest LPs in the world from every category, endowments, foundations, sovereign wealth funds, and iConnections speciality is building and connecting their global network of capital allocators with a diverse range of fund managers. They do this two different ways. They've got their iConnections platform, and they do bespoke events, including one I'll be speaking at. The events are amazing as a guy who knows how to throw great events. And the iConnections platform offers a bunch of great tools like an LP meeting schedule, document sharing, a database of all these industry contacts that they keep up to date, all the world class events and some exclusive content. So if you're a fund manager of any kind, you need to sign up for iConnections at iConnections.io slash twist the first 25 funds to sign up for iConnections Miami 2024 in January of next year will receive a 20% discount. This is the largest capital allocator event in the world with trillions in LP money represented. So sign up at iConnections.io slash twist iConnections.io slash twist. Mm. Yeah. Um, I thought one of the most interesting things I saw in Hugging Face was they're just speaking to this uh, exact, you know, impact of like, who's going to win the open source or the closed proprietary. And if you look at the closed proprietary stuff, open AI, open was the name of it, Elon funded it because he wanted it to be open, then they closed it. So it's really we should start I'm going to start referring to open AI as closed AI. So closed AI, their approach is to not share their work, not share their data. So if you use closed AI, everything you do as a founder, just keep this in mind, they get the benefit of, and they don't share back. So if you, um, is that accurate, you think, Sonny Vinny? That using closed AI means you're giving, but yeah, not getting. I, I, think it, I think it's, unless someone cracks UI in a way, the same way Microsoft and cracked UI and distribution, um, this, is this is Linux versus um, 
you know, and, and, and the, the era is very different, right? So in, in the 90s, like communications and was costly and the internet was expensive. It wasn't as widespread as it is today. So there was remotes. Th- yeah, yeah. So those remotes that, 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 that Microsoft actually, you know, there was a lot of uh, information asymmetry between people not knowing Linux was out there or getting information on how to use it. And the developers were, you know, the uh, UI, UX wasn't something which they were really focused on at that point. It was very developer centric. Um, I think with, with Bard, uh, in particular, Google's resources around this, you, you could find that, that actually that open source is, is the way to go, uh, just because of the pure scale that it gets to. And then the UI, UX issue gets resolved through just, you know, experience that we've had. And now we have better commu- global communications network. So, in, in, where open source failed in operating systems, I think it could succeed in, in, in AI. There was, in operating systems, this idea that Linux or Lindos or any o- number... Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu, Ubuntu is Ubuntu, another one. Yeah, that yeah. like, hey, Windows could be displaced. And it yeah. never was, except yeah. Google then created Chrome. And yes. really, to have a desktop, you really have to be making user-friendly. And these things are not user-friendly. So the fit and finish never competed with Mac and the OS... But I think and this time, I think this time is different. I think we this we, time we, could we, be different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this page is really interesting. This is the is. Open LLM leaderboard, and it has a little description here. And what it says is, uh, with the plethora of large language models and chatbots being released week upon week, often with grandiose claims of their performance, it can be hard to filter out the genuine progress that is being made by the open source community and which model is the current state of the art. The Open LLM leaderboard aims to track, rank, and evaluate LLMs and chatbots as they are released. We evaluate models on four key benchmarks from the Luther AI Language Model Evaluation Harness, I think that's how you pronounce it, a unified framework to test generative language models on large numbers of different evaluation tasks. A key advantage of this leaderboard is that anyone from the community can submit a model for automated evaluation on the GPU cluster, as long as it is a transformer model with weights on the hub. We also support evaluation models with delta weights, yada, yada, yada. Evaluation is performed against four popular benchmarks. AI to reasoning challenge, 25 shot, a set of grade school science questions. Helliswag, 10 shot, a test of common sense inference, which is easy for humans, 95%, but challenging for SOTA models. MMLU, 5 shot, a test to measure text models, multitask accuracy, the test covers 47 tasks, including elementary mathematics, US history, computer science, law, and more. Truthful QAMC, zero shot, a benchmark to measure whether a language model is truthful in generating answers to questions. We choose these benchmarks as they test variety of reasoning and general knowledge. And then it lists them, and you see here 11AM-65B is the model with the highest average. You can see their arc shot and their hello swag and, you know, like where they're done. So the the race is on, boys. Um, I, I don't know, have you seen this before, Sonny or Vinny, this leaderboard? Yeah, you know, I did, and I was looking for a tweet, and I just couldn't find it. There was a leak of a Google document, and or maybe you can look for it, Nick, in the background. Yeah, you mentioned that, this, yeah. Yeah, and the, in the Google document, they basically said, in just a few weeks, and what, you know, we've spent hundreds of millions doing, people spending tens of thousands, and are, you know, getting there just as quickly now because of, you know, and that was all driven by the leak of the Llama, which is, the, you know, the Facebook model. Um, and then, you know, there's just sort of some hot off the presses, news i also dropped it in here it's like you know a mirror from the information basically saying and i like I, i'm just reading it as we're, we're doing this here but i guess open ai is now moving to open source some of their models maybe oh, even in react- AI is going to be open AI again <laughs> yeah i know it's just funny because you've just given them that nickname and so yeah. i just dropped the link in the chat i believe there, it when you, i see it if, they, know, if but, they're going to do it but i yeah. think there's going to be pressure on them to do it because they sam is so smart i would say sam is clever he's even which is even better than smart in this instance he's clever and I think Sam Altman is going to be like, you know, being closed helped us because we could build in stealth. But now that everybody's adopting this and all the best developers are spending time on this, close is going to hurt them. Uh, so let's read from this uh, I mean, uh, story. My, th- my, my thesis on this is that, that the real, um, you know, the real revenue and, and, and the real revenue, dif- uh, revenue and strategic differentiation you have right now is the hardware, not the software. The software can be easily replicated, but the the GPUs that we're running out of that this, this is where I think like the um, big iron, the, 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 yeah, the, exactly. So the ability to produce these chips, uh, aggregate them, and and basically, you know, GPU processing becomes the utility of the future. That's why I'm into stuff like render. I think render is interesting for this sort of thing as well. Like this is where the world changes. We have 
it, you know, if we can utilize efficiently the GPU chips, the software just runs on top of it. You still need the hardware to do the processing. You can't have all this open source, you know, all these different models without it. Like hardware becomes a limiting factor, not software. And of course, you're referring to this A100. This is the well, that's just big... One, that's just one of the... T the, the you know, okay. A100s are, are, I mean, they're powerful. But NVIDIA you, A100s, yeah. But yeah. You, could line up a, you, know, you can line up a bunch of you know, 4090s and get similar output. You know, it's, it's not too far. I mean, they use Tesla cores in the A100s. And I think they use CUDA cores in the in the forty nineties, but you know it, it's it's um, who's going to put up the biggest fight against Nvidia here? And is there an open source hardware project as well? Like uh, I don't know. Yeah, there's, so this no, is something, there's, there's no, no could, there's no open source project. Yeah. So like the the direct competitor, uh, like the most meaningful one is the TPU, you know? right? By Google, that's yeah. the most meaningful one. Um, so Google's and, making their own hardware. Well, Amazon they, as well. They, they Amazon, for, uh, Amazon announced it as well. They're doing the same thing. And, ah. and Google has been for years. They're, they're yeah. on, I don't even know which, you know, third, fourth generation of the TPU. Yeah. Um, so they, they've been doing it for a long time. Um, so does their TP, is the Google TPU available to the public or is it only for their cloud? It's only for their cloud. Got it. So they're yep. making proprietary. And this is something he talked about at Google I.O. a long time ago. They've been Correct. talking about this for a while. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They had, they had a moment, you know, years ago where they were doing more in um, TPU compute than they were in like kind of x86 compute. Yeah. And that, and that wasn't a recent thing. It was several years ago that they, they yeah. had made that, that, uh, you know, point. So really it's going to be GPUs versus TPUs yeah. is the battle but we should be but monitoring. I'll give a counterpoint to, sure. to Vinny's uh, point there, which is, you know, from this, um, we have the Google, we have no moat. Uh -huh. And so, you know, I thought this particular paragraph, this is a really a, a good article. It's worth leading. We read it. Yeah, so people it. who are listening. Yeah, but so, can... yeah for sure. I was going to read this one paragraph. It says, while our models hold a slight edge in terms of quality, the gap is closing astonishingly quickly. Astonishing. Open source model, yeah. Open source models are faster, more customizable, private, and pound for pound more capable. They are doing things with $100 and 13 billion parameters that we struggle with at $10 million and 540 billion, right? And they're doing so in weeks, not months. That has profound implications for us. Yeah. So the interpretation here um, is that, and he says this in bullet points after that paragraph, we have no secret sauce. There is nothing proprietary. There's nothing owned by Google. Um, and then... His second bullet point, people will not pay for a restricted model when free unrestricted alternatives are comparable in quality. And this is something I said on the you know, all-in podcast, and I think here, you know, this lead that OpenAI has, it feels tremendous until it doesn't, right? Because yep. if in a vacuum, it's the only one you can use, and the only one you can see other people using, it feels like it's an insurmountable lead. But then Bard came out, and we started playing with Bard, and it feels like, okay, Bard is at, you know, chat GPT three or 3.5, right? So the gaps will close. And then ultimately the race will be won by the platform that provides the most for the least cost. And the platform that's going to provide the most for the least cost is going to be an open source project. So let me, Spot on. let me just, I want to just jump to Bard versus um, chat GPT. I've been playing around with Bard a lot this week. And it, it's actually very inconsistent. Um, yes, it, it's delusional. It says you, weird shit. Yeah. No, no, you can run the same query twice, and it'll give you different answers. That's how ChatGPT used to be. Yeah, yeah. So, so they're very much behind. I mean, uh, I I asked it to rank. I went through a process where I said rank the top ten vehicle manufacturers in the world based mm -hmm. upon gross profit generated. Right. So, okay. uh, it, it ranked the ten. Tesla wasn't in there. <laughs> so I said to it, "Where is Tesla?" And it responded to me, Bard responded to me saying, oh, my apologies. I didn't see that. Now I didn't realize that Tesla was a vehicle manufacturer, whatever excuse it gave me. And then, yeah. it had, and then it had to update the list for me again, and then it updated it for me. I mean, imagine not having Tesla in that list. How is that possible? I literally just did it. Here are the top automotive models of the US in 2021 and 2022, according to Motor Intelligence. Ford F-Series, Chevy Silverado, Ram pickup, Toyota RAV, Toyota Camry, Toyota Honda. Yeah, there's no Tesla. Yeah, so I did tell it to include In 2022, Tesla. it put Tesla Model Y as number six. Yeah. 
interesting. So, so this is this is the uh, this is the the problem. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's close. To, I mean, I don't think it's good enough yet. Um, I think what it does really well, by the way, is it takes feedback and then it incorporates that feedback. And like for example, mm. I, I did I said tell me about Vanilla Lingham, and it tell it says that Gift was acquired by First Data in 2015 for 390 million dollars. The year is wrong. The amount is very wrong. Uh, you know. Uh, it, it's it's just like all the stuff it said to me. It said I sold another company for hundred million, which I didn't. I don't know where it got right. that from. Um, but you know, and so it's very inaccurate. And, and here's the problem. You, you, and here's what the point I'm trying to make and highlight here is: I think we're going to have um, a lot of bad AI be based upon false information on the internet. So the more fake information that people populate with, the more these AI tools are going to search, read, and then. You know, I know it's trying to give authority to certain sites, but you know, people can like it, it's pulling data from um, you know, w well, w w wikimilly dot com. So on me. can I what can the I give a, wikimilly? can I give an example here? Um, and it's a, a bit of a plug and sort of what we do at Defended It, but it actually gives a really good example. Would you guys mind? Yeah, yeah can, please. I, no, I, plug guys, I have to leave. You guys can keep okay, going. Okay, yeah, get to the airport. Yeah, okay, cool. cool. Thanks, guys. See ya. Everybody, visit waitingroom dot com. Uh, Vinny Lingham. Blah, blah, blah. Follow him on social media and see him at the club, uh, at the music festival. Live the life of Vinny Lingham <laughs> on and, uh, and Instagram. And to search for Vinny Lingham. So I'll and see the Olin Summit. Yeah, see the Olin Summit. I hope you bought a ticket. Uh, <laughs> okay, I hope you cool. bought a ticket, Vinny. Uh, selling out I'll, fast. I don't want to apply for one, but I'll, I'll, I'll buy one. <laughs> Dude, this is a big internal debate. Do I each, have to apply? I mean, seriously? No, you don't have to apply. <laughs> the, the issue is each bestie this year only yeah. gets 25 tickets for their friends and family. So now, I VIP am in the, or regular? We have 25 VIPs each. There's 100 VIPs for this. So now, there's a little bit of brinksmanship going. If you're in the poker group, you know, and you want to get the free ticket, which of the four besties, you know, you might want to go to all four and try to lock up one of those tickets if you're, you know, Xander or you or okay. Sonny. Who's going to get you your free ticket, right? Like you two guys, how do I say no to you if you're coming on the pod every week? I got to, go. kind of hard for me to say no, right? Then we get 25 tickets that are 50% off, I think, is what we've settled on. Okay. Um, but now it's like, this thing's going to sell out. We already sold out the general admission. It's, this is such a hot ticket that now it's like, they're counting how many tickets each bestie gives away. So, so are you saying that Sunny and I are getting two tickets from you, Jay? Well, I mean, how do I say no is the issue, <laughs> but I'm, oh, I would you, very much you, hope Jay. that you lobby <laughs> your, I, I think Sunny's made... A lot of money, a lot more money for Tramath. So Sonny, Sh and Vinny, you guys have business relations. <laughs> oh, you're right. I've made money for Tramath as well. Yeah, so I think you guys got to lobby Tramath so I can save those two tickets for friends and family. I'm actually taking my tickets and I'm selling them on the black market. No. When this thing sells out, I'm selling them for 20K each. So I'm, I'm grifting this big time. That's like a half million right there. I'm going to sell those 25 for 20K each. Okay, Jake, I'll, I'll reach out to one bestie and if they say no, you're Just the Just work on four. Yeah, no, please, no, 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 please, I'll, do, please, I'll, do, I'll do one. I'll do one. I guess, you know, one. like whichever bet, you got to work your besties. <laughs> I think Vinny made the most money to David Sachs, though. Oh, really? Vinny, then yeah, you got, yeah, man, if you got that Solana, Solana. bag, yeah, yeah, yeah you got to yeah, go to town and he's got to give you a ticket. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll ping, I'll ping Sachs. Okay, cool. Yeah, I would do that yeah. now because it, <laughs> yeah. now the word's going to be out when this podcast comes out. Okay, that's cool. the biggest one. Yeah, that's the biggest one. Okay, guys, I'm going to run. See you guys. He dropped that bag on the table. He broke the table in half. Yeah. He's like, hey, I got your envelope. Drop the envelope on the table. Uh, Sax yeah. is like marble table, broken half. He's like, oh, okay. I can get a new table. See Can't you guys. That's a lot of bag. Love you both. Yeah. Bye. All right, love you. Bye. <laughs> let's love you, besties. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's keep going. You got any more examples for us? I mean, God, well, I just so wanted good... to, to, you know, like it just kind of builds on there, and and yeah. uh, you, we can see if it's useful or not. But I'll just I'll share with you guys here. Uh, and and this hopefully I I was going to send this to all you guys because this came up in in the the all in pod as well. So, yep. um, and this really shows like where and Ben Thompson had a tweet this morning as well. Nick, if you can pull it up in the background, let's pull it up right after this. But really, you know where these uh, LLMs are good and where they kind of have some challenges. And so in this particular case, um, you know we asked Bing, which is powered by ChatGPT four, what is the average delay time for each airport in twenty twenty two. It comes up with an answer that we would have no, all been not typically seen. I'll read it quickly here. It says, I found an answer on Stratos Jet that says the average uh, time for airport delays is 15.3 minutes, but this is for all airports, not for each airport. Ah. Um, right. You know, chat GBT is getting better where it doesn't, you know, give you one of those type of standard responses, but it starts yeah. with its, hey, I don't have data beyond, you know, September 2021. 
but it then offers a method which says, hey, you know, to find the average delay time for each airport in 2022, I would recommend going to the you know, authorities website, the FAA, and you could pull it from there and that's how you could get the answer. So it's helpful, but it doesn't give you the answer, but it's at least um, giving you the right directions. Right. Um, Google is finding a result and uh, just kind of flipping through some sides there for people listening. Google finds a result that comes from a page that, you know, a website, eurocontrol.int, which has published delay times and it you know provides the like a this is where google's from there. crawl is so valuable to them they're crawling well, the web and they've indexed yeah. the web so granularly over yeah. so many decades that they've got a big yeah. advantage and they're yeah. doing that in real time yeah. right and this is like sort of in this came up in the all in pot but this is a little bit of like the you know where you can see some of the hallucination happen so in this particular case um you know we asked the same question what is the average delay time for each airport in 2022 and it but, comes up with a list, not all the airports, and it says, hey, LaGuardia is 19 minutes. Now, you or I know, J. Cow, if you've flown in out of LaGuardia, mm -hmm. it's not 19 minutes, yeah, right? Man. And so, but it, this answer looks very, very, uh, you know, it's very confident on this answer. So yeah. we asked the same question inside Definitive. This is a screenshot of our product. We actually go to the airline database and write a SQL query, which is shown here. And we come up with a response that has all 393 U.S. airports and the average delay time. And in this particular case for LaGuardia, it says 74.54 minutes. Okay, mm. so now we want to go and verify this. And so yeah. the only way we can go and do that is we can go off to the you know, Bureau of Transportation Statistics site and go to uh, you know, June 2022, and we can look it up uh, here and say, uh, here is the average delay time. Um, in, in that time frame for 2022, 74.55 minutes at LaGuardia. And so what really this shows here is the LLMs, and, and we use an LLM to come up with a SQL for that answer, uh -huh. but they can be really good reasoning engines, but when you're using them as information retrieval systems, and maybe if you pull up the, um, the, uh, the tweet from Ben this morning, Nick, um, they try to give an answer, which it has seen someone come up with before, which mm -hmm. is not always practical in a scenario when you're looking for a specific answer that's based on data that may not have been published in a web article that it could have crawled. Got it. So what it's doing is it's taking the corpus of journalism, blogging, and using that as a proxy of the data. What you're doing is saying, Okay, if a journalist had gone into that database and then created this document, I'm going to just go directly to the database. The database, yeah. And that's really more definitive intelligence, if you will. Correct. Which is the name <laughs> of your company, Definitive Intelligence. Which happens to be. be the name of your company. And so this <laughs> is like, beyond a crawl is the actual sniper shot. So like a crawl is kind of like spray and pray. You know, what can we find and leverage the collective work of humans and you're saying well screw that there's data there's got to be a database somewhere we can go ingest but that is not what google has done google cannot it's not allowed to go ingest somebody's database that's against the rules um in some it, cases it can you know if they're public data sources it can sure and right but in many cases it, it cannot because the it doesn't allow for it right um and so uh, and sorry, I was I was misquoting. It wasn't Ben. It was Benedict Evans. And uh, I think yeah, if we pull this, oh yes, one up, Benedict Evans, formerly yeah. of A sixteen Z. Yes, yeah, Benedict and, Evans. And, yeah. and and I think you know it oh, sort yes. of highlights Check what we out. just talked, what we just locked about, what we talked about here, right? LLMs do not tell you the answer to your question. They tell you when people ask that question Probably. like this, this is what the answer that other people tend to give tend to look like. And I think this is uh, a really really interesting and you know thoughtful explanation. And, you know, when you're trying to apply the technology, I think is something really to think about, you know, whether you're using it for information retrieval or you're using it for, you know, logic or reasoning. Mm. Yeah. So if you were to ask, you know, um, what's the best Peking duck in New York City? People have asked that question many times. Yes. It's been answered by Time Out New York, Zagats, Yelp, you know, some forum, a newspaper, and... It gave Red Farm and Peking Duck House as the first two. Those are the first two I would have given you. Yeah. Uh, Red Farm is the Peking Duck that I order on Goldbelly as just about one example. And then Peking Duck House is a place where you can bring your own bottle of wine, no corkage fee, and it's 50 bucks a person for Peking Duck. So you can have a table of 10, 500 bucks. You bring 500 bucks in like really great wine. 
bring five bottles of great wine and you're in and out for a wow. thousand bucks for 10 people, a hundred bucks a person. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll take you there next time with them. If you, yeah. if you like picking duck, highly recommend And now this transcript places. is going to get crawled by someone as we were talking about yep. earlier. And then that's going to get added into the corpus of training material for these LLMs. So basically it's going to like, it, it's getting all the chit chat out there and yep. you know, and it, what Google will do is, and this is where it gets really interesting. I've had a conversation about Peking Duck a hundred times in my Gmail yep. with various people. Now, d is that something that it can use publicly? Of course not. But maybe they'll figure out a way to finagle if you're using Gmail for free and there's some yep. knowledge in there. Maybe would point it in the right direction. Who knows what, you know, insane justification they'll use. For taking conversations that were not meant and using them, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, especially behind free products, like you said, right? Where, yeah. you know, th there, you have to understand there's got to be some trade-off of your data or your knowledge oh. that's now being put into other systems. Yeah, that's kind of scary when you think about it. But that's where I think, you know, I really think Google's, uh, and I, I bought Google shares. Um, I don't know when I have to check JTrading, but. When people got down on Google, I was like, I think they're going to incorporate this into everything. And I think at Google I.O., they incorporated it into most things. Most things, yeah. Most things. Now, did they, I didn't see, I didn't watch I.O., but yep. what was their Gmail strategy? Because to me, oh, Gmail it's really incredible. is the um, most important yeah, one. There, There's a... Yeah, yeah. So there's a short, there's a 15 minute summary video at, which I can send you, Jay Cal. It's, it's awesome. The Verge made that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Someone else did. It, it was oh, like, okay. uh, yeah. It was. Uh, it's that's that the was best something we created seen. at uh, Engadget. That Verge, which is like a bunch of former yeah. Engadget editors. It, uh, it was. Uh, it was. It was we one do of the, the best. Steve Jobs keynote in yeah. three minutes. We do the Steve Jobs keynote in one minute, three minutes, and ten minutes. So we'd make oh, like yeah, whatever yeah. version you want to watch. We'll do it. Yeah. But now AI could do that. Yeah, it was a it was a really really incredible summary. I'll, I'll try to find it. It's yeah. uh, I, I tweeted about it here. Uh, here it is. I'll I'll just drop it in here. You can pull it up. But we, we, we're not going to watch it here. It's too long. But uh, um, but really, uh, in terms of the video, Nick, if you want to pull it up after, is that what they're doing in Gmail now? So basically, they're adding a button which is a prompt, and that when you hit that button, you can actually write a prompt to reply to a message, and then when the reply is generated. They have like sort of some options, uh, and I don't oh. remember exactly what they were, which is like, be more aggressive, be more neutral, be more passive, you know, something along oh. those lines. And so if you're fighting with someone about like, uh, you know, canceling something along those lines, you can say, hey, draft me an email that's a response to this. And basically, and then, you know, it generates a response and you can tell it to be you know, more passive, say it's both the same, more aggressive. It was really, really cool. I don't want right? to like uh, tell my J trades. But on uh, March 21st, I bought like a hundred grand uh, in, I bought a thousand shares at about a hundred bucks a piece. Uh, and uh, it went up 17% in a month. <laughs> That's another great J trade. My J trades are right now. Meta and Google. Who would uh, think? They got the Meta one and the Google one. My yeah. J trades are now 7.45 versus the S&P equivalent of 2.5. So I'm, I'm beating the market by 3x, apparently, yeah. on my J trading yeah. This is not trading yeah. advice. Do not follow my yeah. J trades. Um, <laughs> but I think it's just like timing. Uh, I bought yeah. when everybody was scared. I'm getting killed on my Disney trade. Yeah. Just just absolutely slaughtered. And my Amazon trade is getting killed. And my Warner Brothers. But I'm going to buy more of them. Those three companies yeah. are going to figure it out. Disney's going to figure out AI. Yeah. Amazon's got to figure out. Where's Amazon in all this? Where's Amazon? Well, so they partnered with Hugging Face. Okay. So they, they, what does they that mean? did a big... Uh, so they're making it such that, you know, like what we were just showing earlier, yep. uh, if you want to pick models and you want to run them in an infrastructure, they make it, they'll make it as oh. simple as possible within their infrastructure. Got so it. If, if you really think about sort of that open source argument, they are embracing that the most kind of, uh, I guess at the, at the, at the forefront. So if I, if I want to grab the model and start playing with it, it'll just yeah. dump it on my AWS account and let me start playing with it. That's smart. Exactly. And Why did they just buy your... Hugging Face, man? They should have just bought it now. Yeah, I mean, that would be the move, like, you know, a Microsoft and GitHub type thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, similarly, Google did a big investment in Replit. So, yeah, they, that would seem like a good move for them. Yeah. That's, I think that yeah. Gmail thing where it understands tone is going to be really, really powerful.
So AWS yeah. then Switzerlanded it. They're not like Azure's yeah. like use OpenAI. AWS is like, listen, use whatever you want. Here's a bunch of options. Yep. That's and what then they Google did. will do what? Google Cloud. So, so Google Cloud, and then this was also at I.O., they are basically going down the approach of uh, there are going to be multiple models of different sizes, mm -hmm. and we will allow you to run uh, Google models of different sizes uh, within your infrastructure with your own data. Got so um, like allow you to have a model that's private running within your VPC, like your virtual private cloud connected to your data. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a really smart approach for enterprises that already, and cause you know, Google has one of the leading data product or a couple of the leading data products, but like the largest one probably being BigQuery, which is a large analytical database. And so a lot of companies rely on that. And so it's, it's a really smart place to, you know, plug into. Uh, and they gave some oh, also really great demos there as well. I think Nick has the Gmail video. If you have the Gmail video, Nick, we should pull that up real quick for, for Jason because he didn't see that last week. All right, here's a 44-second clip. We'll see you on the other side. Say you're writing to your neighbors about an upcoming potluck. Now, as you can see, Sidekick has summarized what this conversation is about. Last year, everyone brought hummus. Who doesn't love hummus? But this year, you want a little more variety. Let's see what people signed up to bring. Somewhere in this thread is a Google Sheet where you've collected that information. You can get some help by typing, write a note about the main dishes people are bringing, and let's see what we get back. Awesome. It found the right sheet and cited the source in the found in section, mm. giving you confidence that this is not made up. It looks good. You can insert it directly into your email. Wow. That's so powerful. It should have a button that would be like the JCal button, which would be like troll this person. <laughs> and it would be like troll <laughs> options. And like my troll option would be like, why do you, why does Hamas, why does everybody hate Hamas? And then link to the clip of Sasha Baron yeah. Cohen. When yeah. He's <laughs> talking about Hamas and Hamas. And he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's like uh, trolling them. Trolling option should be there to do like yeah. jokes and stuff like that. I, that yeah. would be a great startup is uh, an agent that follows you around the internet and then optimizes your trolling and comedy and just makes a, you know, a mockery of everything. Mockery AI. Somebody go grab that domain and mockery AI. All right, anything oh, else happening this week that we should talk about as we wrap here? I think we did a lot. I think- uh, It's a lot to process, yeah, everybody. Yeah. All right, and then tomorrow on the show, we'll uh, talk about Karen AI. I don't know if you saw that one go by, but some influencer uploaded herself and she's now made a- they used to have these in the back of the village voice. Like you could pay a dollar a minute to dollar a minute, yeah. Talk to, to somebody a in a right. um adult fashion. And I'm gonna be yeah. careful not to get us censored here on the YouTube. Um but there's a dollar a minute virtual girlfriend for lonely yeah. people. I think she made like seventy K in the first week. I mean, I think people are gonna try that. Yeah, that yep. seems dystopian and crazy. Um and sensational but i don't know is that going to be a long maybe they'll just build it into only fans and then whatever you upload to only fans it then makes a model of you that's model interactive yeah. i mean that yeah. makes sense to me yeah. that you could have an interactive version of every person there and then you could and it's like a real upsell premium if you want the person live all right everybody we'll see you next time on this week in service bye bye